Welcome back, everyone, to the Sacred Trial, the pro qualifier to the True Silver Championship coming up at the end of August, sponsored by Game. I am Raven. Joining me to continue the evening is Sottle, and we've had some great games so far, some crazy sets. We've just had a 3-0 from Oskaka versus Live Coach, sweeping with the Zoo deck. So, you know, this is the sort of thing Last Hero Standing, you know, is built for, I guess, the potential for players to 3-0 with a single deck. Do you think we're going to see uh, much more of that going forward? or you know is it maybe not happen too often yeah i think it's just built into the fiber of the system right like you are gonna get some three zeros as i said when we when we opened this was one of the big complaints about last hero standing that people first had i don't i don't think you know as compared as a competitive hearthstone scene i don't think we've really hit on the perfect format yet i mean people have their complaints with conquest people have their complaints with last hero standing it's it just comes with the territory that, you know, everyone is, is going to favor the other one when you're watching the <laughs> negatives of the one that you're watching happen over and over again. It's just kind of natural. But last hero standing, sure. I mean, you can choose to leave power decks up and get swept by them. Um, but if you're getting 3 owed in last hero standing, either you've lost unfavored matchups. So you've lost favored matchups, in which case, you know, that kind of happens. It's just variance in Hearthstone. You have to move on and hope that next tournament is your day and the matchup goes as it's supposed to. Or you've built your lineup wrong, right? You haven't, you've brought the wrong lineup to the tournament. You've read the meta wrong and someone's just sweeping you with a deck that you're not expecting. So either way, it's not a huge issue, but will we see more 3-0 sweeps during this qualifier? Yes, almost certainly we will. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, to be expected. But as you said, I think the good thing is everyone appreciates a mixture of formats, right? You know, as you said, whenever one format is overplayed, everyone wants a different one. But we are going into the game pretty soon, and it is going to be RDU versus Dog. So, yeah, another, uh, going to be, yeah, another Titanic battle. And it looks like RDU banned Warlock, and Dog banned his Shaman. And the lists overall, as I just find them somewhere... Uh, Dog has Warrior, Rogue, Warlock, and Shaman. And RDU has Mage, Hunter, Warlock, and Shaman. So Warrior, Rogue, Mage, and Hunter. They're the different decks here. It's no surprise, really, uh, that Warlock and Shaman is in almost everyone's lineup this tournament. Absolutely not. And no surprise that, say, RDU is bringing Mage and Dog is bringing Rogue. Of course, if you watched DreamHack, you saw RDU evangelize at length about how <laughs> Tempo Mage was the best deck in the game. RDU, one of the one of the players that casters are always happy to see come up to the desk for an interview because you know you're going to get value. RDU's interviews at DreamHack basically consisted of, hey, RDU, how are you? And then RDU just talking for five minutes, which is great. That's exactly what we want. No one wants to hear us talk. They want to hear the players talk. So RDU talked at length about how great Tempo Mage was. And Dog, from his side, is well known as a rogue player. And rogue players will bring rogue to tournaments with remarkable consistency because they're loyalists and they think that correctly played rogue gives you an edge over the field because rogue is one of the classes with the highest skill ceiling in the game. So if you are a top tier rogue player, there's more room for you just to eke out a skill advantage versus your opponent with rogue than there is with any other class. Yeah, and as you said before the break, RDU, a previous Insomnia True Silver Championship champion, and Dog, a runner-up from the uh, the most recent True Silver champion, losing to Ness in the finals. So both of these players have a very vested interest in making it through this uh, qualifier and being able to go to the next one at the end of August. As you know, RDU definitely won in his second win, his second uh, True Silver win. And Dog, you know, got so close last time, but just not quite enough to finish it out there. So uh, this matchup is going to be really cool. We see, again, just mentioned the bans. RDU going with the Warlock ban. Looks like he has a very uh, similar strategy to what he did at DreamHack. You know, banning White Warlock, leaving up Shaman as he believes his his uh, deck choice can actually, uh, you know, just take the win versus Shaman a lot of the time. And we are going to the first game, which is going to be RDU's. To no surprise of anyone's Tempo Mage versus <laughs> Dog's Rogue. So, you know, RDU only very recently, I guess, you know, coming out of the gates with the Tempo Mage is like his deck. Um, but Dog bringing his Rogue, you know, these two players starting off with their number one deck at the moment. So kind of cool to see that this is going to be the first game. Yeah, absolutely. This is the the matchup that I'm, I'm definitely looking to see. Like both, it's, it's hard to say that, you know, Tempo Mage is, is RDU's deck already at this point, but... 
when you win a major and you accredit so much of your success to an individual deck decision, you know, he there were there were quotes from him like, you know, I, I felt like I'd never had a better lineup for a tournament than this in yeah. my life. And, you know, a big part of that was the tempo mage. So, as I said, uh, Dog highly identifies as a rogue player. He's a rogue specialist. He's a rogue loyalist. So seeing these two go back to back is definitely a matchup that I was looking forward to see. Glad that we are seeing it. Both have pretty promising opening hands. RDU has the Mana Worm, which is always a huge deal for Tempo Mage, plus the Tempo spells to back it up. But from Dog's side, he has that SI7 Agent. He also has an early prep, which is a huge deal in a matchup which is played exclusively for Tempo. Yeah, we're gonna. Uh, it's more than likely we're going to see that prep used very early just to slow down RDU's sort of explosive opening here. But yeah, it's funny, you know, RDU... Tempo Mage isn't, you know, always been his deck. It's a very recent thing, but let's be honest. He was saying from, I think, the first interview of his first one match that Tempo Mage is actually, you know, the best deck he's brought to this tournament. One of the best decks he's ever actually been involved in actually making because he, like, created most of it with help from friends, you know, teammates, of course. But, you know, he made the deck. He was like, this is possibly the best creation i've ever had in my whole career and rdu's had quite a good career in hearthstone so far so you know and he continued to back it up over the course of the weekend so we could see whether he manages it again and his dog just hero powers there nothing too crazy this turn but i will imagine it won't be too much of a surprise to see prep eviscerate si to clear the two at least damaging minions on the board on the use side here absolutely he did have the fan of knives if there wasn't another minion to come out he is actually going to go for the fan here he's going to keep the oh. si in hand he's going to go for double fan and the weapon poke to clear that addresses the entire board it gets the mirror images out of the way so his dagger can actually have an impact in the game and now he still has the si7 agent in hand with a potential combo activator conceal not always a card that's considered as a combo activator but in this purpose it will get the job done quite nicely shadow strike off the top though <laughs> That is a huge draw. Yeah, I was just about to agree with you there. Uh, very likely we would have seen Conceal Eviscerate because Flame Waker is such a threat in this deck. But when you just draw Shadow Strike, as and when you need it, that's pretty good as well. And Dog continuing the really strong curve here with the Azure Drake. And he has the minion on the board um, first, you know, or at least has a minion on empty board versus RDU Mage here. So like we said, this is all about tempo and getting ahead. And... Adi would probably really wish he had one more mana to play his own Drake in the Arcane Blast for four there to clear up Dog's side of the board, but he might be forced into a Frostbolt here. Yeah. I think for that reason, we will definitely see Frostbolt ping this turn. You know, matching up minion for minion against Rogue is not the winning line. If you let Rogue sit with a minion on, on the board like that, then they're just going to use their removal to leverage that one minion and just enforce tempo on you. So... Dealing with the threat in front of you was definitely more appealing. And then you'd be kind of hoping to see, say, Tomb Pillager on the following turn. So you then have Azure Drake, Arcane Blast. Uh, with the two 3-3s three coming down, that's not quite as appealing. So he's just going to go ahead and drop the Faceless Summoner here. And he gets one Ooh. of the absolute high rolls. King Mookla picking up the double 5-5 five five for six mana. Yeah, it's a pretty good value there and there. And then just to note, I think as long as RDU's deck hasn't changed from DreamHack, he's only playing one faceless summoner in his deck i believe so you know being able to get that out and actually just even up the well more than even up the board as his minions actually just overpower the two three threes on the board at the moment but that was definitely one of the cards he needed to draw this back and uh you know other than his signature flame strike that's uh, in the deck somewhere yeah and i love this sap you're not gonna get a better sap target than this right now sapping the mookla if it ever gets replayed hey guess what you get two one mana spells in your hand that's a pretty sick deal when you're playing Miracle Rogue. And the sap allows him to tempo out with the SI7 agent, basically reset the board to the position he had at the start of the game with two 3-3s three against nothing. And now that Mookla is a pretty annoying-looking proposition if you're RDU here because you do not want to give a rogue that plays Gadgetzan Auctioneer one-mana spells. On top of that, they're just excellent for, for activating combo effects as well. Yeah, it's just uh, good no matter which way you look at it for the Rogue. RDU has drawn into the Flame Waker, though. But he's choosing to take it a little bit slower. He has Arcane Blast to clear up one of the 3-3s. Three and uh, I doubt he's going to use the Missiles here and just pass, I think. This shows some restraint from RDU. Um, I think a lot of players try and get Flame Waker down as soon as possible. And then just you know spam out spells and hope for the best. Whereas really taking your time and getting a super powerful Flame Waker turn often leads to victories with this deck. 
Yeah, timing Flame Wakers is one of the probably the most unappreciated skills with this deck because, yeah, you're right, a lot of people do it too early, but at the same time, I think a lot of people have the tendency to hold on too long and try and go for that mm. big wombo combo Flame Waker with, you know, four or five spells in hand. So picking the exact right time and place to drop your Flame Waker is, is definitely one of the things that you have to pick up over time with this deck if you're going to achieve the, the maximum win rate. And it might just be a case of coming out with it now. The the two lines are potentially Water Elemental and Fireball, or Flame Waker, Fireball, Arcane Missiles, try and go for the full clear. Yeah, I think I kind of like the Flame Waker. As you said, you do want it down. You know, it's not something you hold on to forever. And this lines up pretty well to almost guarantee the 3-3 three, three dying. It looks like RDU completely disagrees, though, as he goes for the other line, which is the Water Elemental. Just gets it down the board and sort of demands its 6 health, a pretty hefty response from Dog. And if it's not killed, then Dog ha uh, Adu, sorry, has the opportunity to you know, freeze the rogue, which isn't super impactful, but is definitely a, a, you know, a help and a, a huge benefit. Yes, indeed. The Gadgetan pickup with the coin and the conceal in hand already is massive here. And the potential keep of the Flame Waker might have been for this exact consideration, which is if he conceals an auctioneer, how do I ever beat that? Well, Flame Waker Arcane Missiles at least has a shot. You can combine that with Arcane Intellect and potentially further spells as well. Picks up his second preparation now off the conceal. And the Shiv... He this is this is a crazy auctioneer turn from a hand that started with very little. Now the cold blood, the cold as well, blood to combo with the concealer, <laughs> just goes from strength to strength. Backstab as well. It never ends for dog. This and is was that another cold blood turn. It certainly is. Oh. That is cold blood number two. Okay. Could, could that have gone any better? Uh, yes, either you could hit concede. Uh, that's as uh, good as the turn's going to get. It looks like he's going to go for the Flame Waker, though. He has Mirror Image. Probably either you imagine that uh, Flame Strike would have been a pretty reasonable draw that turn. But Flame Waker into at least a fair amount of spells. Second Arcane Missiles is huge. He has three spells to play. Two of those do three separate damage each anyway. So the odds on him actually clearing this board up are relatively high. But we will have to see. Is this Gadget Zen going down? Is going to be pretty key here. With right, the gadgets so and taking the hits. He needs there one shot out of five yeah. to hit the auctioneer. He gets it. And now this water elemental freezing face, from his perspective, is a really, really, really big deal. But uh, unfortunately, Eviscerate plus Sap plus a Leroy Jenkins to the dome is going to be enough to get the job done. So there you go. That that game, I think, all hinged on that, that Sap on the King Mookla turn because... That was basically a two-mana assassinate that he used, because that Mookla was unplayable after that point. That card might as well have not been in hand. There's basically no consideration from RDU to feed a Miracle Rogue that kind of food. And from that point, not only did he get a great sap on the minion, he was also able to tempo out with the SI7 agent, get total dominance on the board. And it was it was a combination of that turn and the early prep that just meant that RDU never really got started in that matchup. Yeah, and also it just slowed uh, slowed him down enough that Dog had the time to do the Gadget Zan turn, and that was one hell of a Gadget Zan turn as well. <laughs> just kept being perfect spell after perfect spell, cycling through all those cards, and the Cold Bloods as well, which opened up the sheer amount of damage that allowed Dog to finish the game with a very unorthodox Eviscerate and Sap onto two zero twos, but it did the job to open up the gap for the Leroy to finish up, and how do you... He's going to lock in his Hunter for the next game versus Dog's Rogue. So feeling pretty confident, as we can see, this is the Camel variant. So as far as I'm aware, there's going to be no one drops in this Rogue list. So Camel will get some pretty nice value. Although it'll be interesting to see whether uh, we find out if I had to use playing the double Kvalde one bat or double bat one Kvalde as they are the two most common variants. Yep, and just based on his mulligan there, we can also pick up that he's playing Tigers and High Mains. You know, Tigers, fantastic card against Rogue. High Main often less so, but um, I think people overstate how bad High Main is against Rogue a lot of the time. If you're able to curve out aggressively early on, especially with Houndmaster, quite often you can force a Sap out before a High Main has to come down. So in that situation, your High Main can potentially get a lot of work done. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the problem with that idea is that it's very memorable when you play a high main on turn six, if you have an empty board, and then they just go, eh, two mana, yeah. go, on, go again. And that's the problem. When you play it on an empty board without, as you said, putting pressure on early enough onto the rogue. Do you see the camel comes out, and there is a fiery bat that gets cleared up by the Thanos. So one damage, going to face, and leaving the 2-4, chilling. 
Indeed, but still, the 2-4 is preserved. He essentially, you know, it was a, it was a three-mana 2-4 with Battlecry, Kill of Love, Mage Thanos, which isn't the worst thing in the world. But, of course, would have loved to pick up the Cavaldir there. But, the, again, the early prep from Dog. And this is how you know Dog is a good rogue player. <laughs> he, he draws prep every single game. That is how you make Rogue look unbeatable. And we know Adi you may not be a specialist with Hunter because he has freezing trap. He neither has freezing trap or deadly shot to deal with the bank leaf as it comes down. So being able to put the tomb pillager down there and start getting some pretty huge minions on the board, considering it's only turn four. Yes, indeed, considers where to send the damage, sends it to face. Definitely like that decision. The Houndmaster here really isn't a big threat. There's no value trade for it on the board. It goes one for one with the Tomb Pillager. It doesn't contest the Edwin. So definitely don't feel the need to play around Houndmaster in this situation. It looks like RDU oh. is just going to try and find a defensive play with the Kill Command. Would love to take out the 6-6 six, six in combination with the Flame Juggler's Battle Cry, but... Now he's got a bit of an awkward decision to make about whether kill commanding the Tomb Pillager is worth it or whether to go for the Animal Companion. Yeah, I think he actually got the worst Animal Companion there. Yeah. As, as the other two um, impacted the board instantly, the Leoc would have allowed the Wolf to trade straight into the Tomb Pillager, or the Hoffer would have traded into the Tomb Pillager and left the Wolf alive regardless. So he's going to put the Wolf into the Van Cleef, make both minions die to Misha, so whichever one may or may not trade into it will get rid of, and then the rest of the minions should be able to clear up what's left. But Dog does have a few options, and he is looks like he's going to heal the Van Cleef. Really nice play there. Go for the heal and eviscerate onto the Misha, and uh, even coin out a Cold Blood and say, Get him! Yeah. Yep. Let's, you know, and you know what? This is such a, this is one of those turns where you decide to go become the aggressor in the matchup, which is rogue. Normally you play slightly more defensive and reactive and then just pile on the pressure by just clearing the board to, uh, too easily. But now Dog's just turning up the heat and on nine health and RDU sort of pitiful board on his side. There's not much you can do against this from Dog. Yeah, I mean, just look at how well the power is spread out on this board, right? Nine, four, six, six, three, three. That's an absolute nightmare for a hunter to deal with. This isn't just all in on a single target that could get deadly shot or freezing trapped, as you mentioned earlier. This is just going to be an absolute nightmare for RDU to deal with. And Dog, even though he's pretty much dumped his entire hand to push for this early tempo, has two refills in his hand with Phantom Knives and Drake. And RDU just says, all right, enough's enough. You win this one, friend. Let's move on to the next game. Yeah, and actually just looking at what RDU had available then, as you said, the power spread and the health on the minions was so, so well that there was no actual combination that really gave RDU even a chance at that yeah. point. Hence the concede. And Dog is going to go on a very quick 2-0 up with his Rogue, showing his mastery of the class that, to be honest, we expect nothing less. And those early preps really go into town against RDU as he locks in his Warlock as his last deck. And I imagine if his Dream Map performance were anything to go by, yeah, it, it's Zoo. It is Zoo. And yet again, there's the preparation from Dog. Doesn't He's have anything, anything too spectacular to go with it just yet. Does pick up double Eviscerate now, though, but he'll be looking for the minion to go alongside that. And we see Acidic Swampoos teched into the Zoo from RDU, which is a thing that's getting slightly more and more popular on Ladder these days. If you uh, play a lot of ladder, you naturally play against a lot of zoo, and I'm sure you've seen Acidic Swampoos come down on more than one occasion. It's a, a tech that they're kind of considering as a zero risk option these days because the meta is so heavily dominated by warriors, shamans, this this kind of thing. Like Acidic Swampoos is a card that's going to get value more often than not. Yeah, especially when Fire Warax is so impactful against this deck, you know, being able to just cut out the second charge and put a threat on the board is actually huge in Zoo. We see the Peddler come down now, Possessed Villager, Young Dragonhawk. I don't know if you watched it, Sado, but Young Dragonhawk at the uh, American uh, Championship Finals was a pretty impactful card with double power overwhelming finishing up a game uh, for Sidonia, but this not being the case in this match as either you takes the corruption as he won't exactly be setting up lethal by picking up that one drop this turn Yeah, seems a bit ambitious to go for the <laughs> the young Dragonhawk power overwhelming dream this early on But as I said preparation has been drawn from dog removal spells has been drawn from from dog But what you want to go with that is a minion that you can leverage for tempo in the same turn So he does have that blood mage which can potentially be useful with a fan of knives if he was to pick that up alongside the prep. But 
for now, he's kind of just stuck one for one in with the stuff that Zoo plays, which is a, a game that Zoo is going to win eventually, unless Dog can make something out of the ordinary happen. Yeah, it looks like um, nothing too crazy in Dog's hand, as you mentioned. Like, normally a sap would be pretty nice here onto the Imp Gang boss, if you don't have, you know, a, any minion based uh, or like a coin tomb pillager to come out. Looks like he's just going to go for the dagger and the deadly poison in there. I think that dagger's probably not going to be around for too much longer after this turn. And he didn't attack. Yeah, I mean... Wow. Who, I mean, there's can... no reason to attack, don't exactly. get me wrong. There's no who reason. Can, who can blame him? I mean, that's obviously a hold situation. Again, the deck lists aren't revealed, so you know you're not... You don't know you're playing around ooze, and there just isn't a good target on the board for a deadly poison attack that turn. So definitely can't fault his decision to hold on to it, but it gets blown out enormously and immediately by that acidic swamp ooze. <laughs> you can see that the temptation with the SI7 agent to just punish that ooze straight away. Yeah. We just point it at the ooze and then, okay, actually, no, the knife juggler is the right target. Fair enough. Yeah. Let me calm myself down. Although I do want revenge on the ooze, it will die at some point, but not this turn. So, yeah, either you draw into the abusive, which will allow him to actually just trade the imp into the 3 3, therefore guarding the ooze and the death rattle on the possessed villager, and allow him to play another villager. And more than likely tap first anyway, as I've heard tapping first is normally a pretty good idea uh, in most situations. It's usually the way to play your turn, yeah. My my worry, slight concern with this line, if I was in RDU shoes right now, is that I'm worried about exposing myself to Fan of Knives a little bit. Maybe that would have been enough to see me trade in the 1-1 one, one and keep the two Death Rattles intact. Um, maybe even just jamming Doomguard that turn was viable since you weren't losing too much high value stuff from your hand that way but he just decides to disrespect Fan of Knives a little bit, thinks that he can beat Fan of Knives essentially so why not just push all in against it yeah that's kind of interesting um, Yeah, he did end up with one additional 1-1 one -one by that play but I would have probably naturally leaned towards using the, uh, the Imp instead but you know, with the second Villager down he's at least a little bit resistant to the AoE and uh, do you pick it up a one drop? Is this going to be the turn for the Doom Guard? As Dog is only on 18 health at the moment and he can push for additional 8 this turn. I think having picked up Argus, Argus is quite a power card in itself, so I don't see anything too wrong with getting the Argus out first here, but the Doom Guard does set up a lethal, so RDU deciding to, to go down that line, and he's just essentially like one buff away from being able to pick this up on the next turn. Yeah, and he'll have two goes at it as well, as he will be able to tap and pretty much play anything he draws regardless, you know, outside of maybe a Sea Giant if the minions get cleared up, etc. But uh, Dog, not looking too great, and there's the Concede, his hand... You know, just prep Leroy Cobalt Cobalt. Would have been pretty nice if there was a little bit lower health on RDU. But RDU does get the win, so isn't going to get swept by the Rogue. But now he has to win the rest of the set with his Warlock. And I believe Dog has his Warlock and his Warrior left. I can't. I, I didn't actually write down the bands because I'm mm -hmm. stupid. I know, RDU banned Warlock, so he has Shaman ah. and Warrior of Ah, okay. Okay, and then, to no one's surprise, Dog is going to lock in the Warrior for this game. As Shaman, as we said earlier, not got the best matchup versus Zoo, so Dog's just going to go with the uh, the power play here. And with the Dragon in the hand, it looks like this could be yet another Dragon Warrior, uh, similar to what we saw earlier on. Yeah, Dragon Warrior deck that really, really is gaining in popularity. It's such a well-balanced deck. It has essentially four fiery war axes because of the extra alex Strauss's champions that can you know do the job of coming out on turn two killing one minion and then sticking around to kill a second minion um so for that reason it's it's reasonably well contested against aggro decks like zoo but then it's just so chunky in the mid game that it's able to just pound down control decks at the same time so it's a really really well-rounded deck and this is one of the most annoying interactions in the game as the aggro player. When you lead out with Argent Squire, it gets immediately blood to Ickard. Ardy, you'll be looking down at that possessed villager he just drew and be saying, bro, where were you? I wanted you on turn one. I didn't want this stupid Squire. <laughs> but but at least he had it this turn to actually block out the, uh, the ooze a little bit here. As if he just played the Peddler, uh, he would just die to it. So the Voidwalker going to do some work, potentially. Um, Dog does have the option of playing the Ghoul, but he would lose the ooze anyway by trading to the Voidwalker. And there would still be a 1-1 one, one on the board. And then the ghoul becomes a little bit weak to Abusive Sergeant, for example. And if I'm honest, I always try and keep hold of the ghoul myself uh, right. to deal with the Forbidden Ritual. As when you don't have a clear, that's actually one of the problems. Uh, one of the main issues you face versus Zoo as a warrior deck when you don't have those whirlwind effects. 
Yeah, and I think he just has plenty of other viable plays this turn. There's no need to really overreact to this board state just yet. I mean, Ravaging Ghoul is a good enough card against Zoo that you can just kind of hold it as a trump card. Like, it's going to be good on another turn in this game. You don't have to do it right now. So, you know, he can take the init- try and take the initiative with a Frothing Berserker. He can use Blood to Ica number two that he just drew to be able to trade into the 1-3 and get another 2-2 on board that way. So I'd be surprised to see the Ravaging Ghoul come down this turn. We are going to see a coin play, but it looks like he's favoring the frothing, and I definitely agree with this line if he goes for it, yeah. yeah. This is nice. It just provides a threat to your opponent that he has to deal with, but that is a very good answer to the threat, as Power of Woman is drawn from RDU, and he can use that to just clear up this frothing with one of his minions and uh, potentially just continue on from there and may- maybe leave the 2-2 up, uh, as he would lose a good chunk of board there trading away, but can get the peddler down as well to see what happens first. Yeah, so going to lead out with the Peddler here, see what he picks up, and then the Power Overwhelming decision, again, very similar to the Fan of Knives decision in the fo- in the previous game. You can choose to ensure your board a little bit against Unstable Ghoul by holding on to the Death Rattle and just Power Overwhelming the, the Raw 1-1 one, one into it. But since RDU has Forbidden Ritual in his hand, he probably feels like he can beat Unstable Ghoul anyway, so we'll probably just see him max out on his board presence here. No, he is going to use the Squire. Yeah, interesting. interesting. Yeah, because if the um, if if anything, you might even not really bait because you never really want to see ghoul oh. come out. But but do you know what I mean? Like you might actually want to try and bait the uh, bait the ghoul anyway because he has the refill. As you said, you know he can actually beat that ghoul out. Since he ended up trading anyway, it's kind of the same thing, whichever way he did it. I personally probably would have gone face with the remaining minions. This is a, a matchup where you kind of have to be aggressive, in my opinion, because if you let the warrior deck get to the point where their big mid game threats are coming down their big late game threats are coming down then suddenly just the natural little bit of life tapping that you've done means that you're facing down lethal straight away so i like getting the job done as quickly as possible from the zoo side in this matchup but if rdu decided he was trading that turn it didn't actually really make a difference which target he used the po on yeah so rdu after seeing the ghoul now he's going to go straight for the forbidden ritual it looks like but maybe just wait up whether he wants to play the void walker uh, soak up the hit from the ghoul or not but he would lose a 1-1 and then forbidden ritual for three mm, it's okay it could be better could have four <laughs> five why not just it wait it, we'll it, just wait we'll do it next turn but it could only be seven max so that's uh, definitely something to consider there is a be- limit <laughs> But yeah, I mean, this is this is kind of the the new version of the implosion versus swipe dance that used to go on in the matchup, right? Where you try and force the druid to swipe, and then you'd refill with implosion on the turn after. This is kind of the equivalent of that. You bait out the ravaging ghoul as best you can, and you refill with the ritual. So yeah, no surprise to see this happening. I like the extra one one. Like you said, the one three can block the attack of the three three. Sure, but. The 3 3 would still be going into the best minion on the board that turn, right? Like the 3 yeah. 3 would attack the 1 3, so what does it really do? You're essentially just throwing away your 1 3 for nothing. Yeah, exactly. I, I completely agree. The, the extra 1 1 is actually just more valuable. He does choose to trade into the ghoul. So what this does is set up the uh, a defense against a second ghoul from the warrior. And at this point, RDU is probably just thinking, why not? Uh, why not be defensive with it and just set up an awkward position for the ghoul because if a second ghoul does come down and the uh, the current ghoul on the board lives, he's in a bit of, bit of a rough state with a 3-2 and a 3-3 challenging absolutely nothing on the board on the zoo side. Sure, so he does pick up the Twilight Guardian, which can't be activated itself since it's the solo dragon in hand, but he is just going to play it out as a 2-6 here. Just follow his curve, essentially, and just say, you know what? I'm not going to take a trade into a 1-1 here with a 3-1. I respect myself as a human being too much to do that. I'm just going to push the face damage. Knife Juggler being picked up has the potential to punish that, though. Voidwalker now coming down. And see where this knife goes against the snipe. So immediately punished. Yeah, that was um, you know pretty pretty impactful there from RDU. The snipe from the juggler is huge. Is now dogs only got one minion to work with, and this is where it starts getting a bit tricky versus Zoo when they've their board is just so wide, and you might have a really good started minion, but as we can see, even just like a PO and a trade could be enough to kill that two six if RDU thinks it's enough of a threat. But it looks like he could well be saving it just to go uh, more aggressive. As you said, he kind of does need to do the damage at some point. And so far, it's been going pretty slow for him. 
Yeah, and we, we kind of glossed over it, but that decision to drop the 2-6 Twilight Guardian was interesting for a number of reasons. I mean, the positives. You got a 2-6 on the board. A 2-6 versus the board that he was looking at was really good, right? There was, there was just 1-1s one on the board. So 2-6 is a great shape to be able to deal with that. But not only did he play it in unactivated form when it could potentially get more value later, but he also stranded that Alex Straza's champion in his hand by playing the only dragon he had. And that charging 3-3 three three is one of the best tools... Probably the best tool apart from Fiery War Axe and, you know, debatably uh, Blood to Ica as well, alongside the Ravaging Ghoul that we've already seen. You know, one of the best tools in your deck. So deactivating that from being able, being able to come out and have an impact was uh, definitely a huge downside to the play. Yeah, because he still had options, right? He could have Alex Drys a champion like Slam, Blood to Ica. He had all yeah. those cards in hand, so he did have the options there. But he has chose to just play the Alex Drys champion as a 2-3. Uh, you know, just throw away the uh, the charge ability because he could just not draw a dragon and just, you know, favor having the 2 3 minion on board, which on this board against either you is looking pretty good. There's two abusive sergeants and a power of warming, so definitely a lot of damage from hand potential. But is it enough? As this is, you know, 2 5, a 2 2, and a 2 3 when you only have four 1 1s on the board. Uh, not feeling too great for RDU at the moment. I mean, it's enough. You can PO a 1 1 into the 2 5, abusive a 1 1 into the 2 3, abusive a 1 1 into the 2 2. You're left with one damage face and two 2 1s and a 1 1 on the board afterwards. So it's good enough. It's less than ideal. And then, of course, you have the consideration of do I forego one of those trays to develop another minion? But that other minion is the Acidic Swamp Ooze, which you don't really want to play tempo ooze against a warrior most of the time. So. The power overwhelming double abusive play, I'm sure, is what we're going to see here. And like I said, it, it, it does enough. It addresses the board and leaves you with a, a decent amount of board dominance yourself. But it's it's not the big aggressive board that you'd like to have at this point. Yeah, luckily enough, Rady, you the weapon, which sounds kind of weird. Lucky for the zoo, the warrior draws fiery war axe. Because it means, he, although he does lose one of the abusives on the board, he can Ooh. get an ooze down and also refill with Forbidden Ritual, if you like, as well as squeezing in a life tap. Because as we said earlier, there is a maximum to how far Forbidden Ritual can go, as there's only so much space on the board. So this is actually a really strong turn for IDU, especially when looking at Dog's hand, when he only really has Grom and an Execute. Grom, he can't play next turn anyway, and there'll be zero damage minions at the moment to deal with the Execute. Yeah, Execute is a, a decent tempo card against Zoo a lot of the time, but um, Dog has spent most of this game just staring at a board of one health minions, which of course Execute is pretty much useless against. But having now drawn that Imp Gang boss, he might be tempted just to go for the natural five mana play. But what I will say is from RDU's perspective, wow, he doesn't even play the ooze. All right, so let me let me finish my thought. From RDU's perspective, your board was 2-1-2-1-1-1 last turn, and it did not die. So you know there is no Ravaging Ghoul in hand, which means only a top deck is going to punish you. That is exactly what happens. Wow, that, yeah, I was on the same wave there. <laughs> exactly. So the Ghoul did come out because, let's be honest, Dog would have been in a very scary situation if the Ghoul wasn't drawn, right? So that's what RDU was thinking, as you said. But luckily for RDU, he does have a pretty decent follow-up. The weapon still wasn't used, of course, because the board was cleared with the Ghoul. And the ooze can now be played to clear off that second charge and get the Imp Gang Boss down. And now with Doomguard and no other cards in hand, and he can probably play whatever he draws next turn, he does have a bit of a power play himself to keep up with Dog's clear there. Yeah, but Grom going to come down, enable the value trades into the Imp Gang Boss, and suddenly the big threat of Grom on the board, this is the situation I talked about early on, where if you don't get the job done early, suddenly these big power threats from, from Dog start to threaten to burst you back the other way. Of course, this deck plays a Draconid Crusher as well, which is just about in reach of coming out as a 9-9 in the next couple of turns if he was to draw one. So this is uh, starting to potentially slip away from RDU, but that Argus is a massive draw. And let's be honest... He deserves a massive draw after <laughs> yeah. what happened to him on the previous turn. I was going to say, both players really just getting the cards off the top as and when needed. It's almost as if they're just choosing which cards they need for the perfect situation here. As Argus was just enough to squeeze in mana-wise and provided some, uh, some nice small speed bumps for Grom to just uh, you know drop his health to there over a course of a couple of turns. But as you said, there is the Draconid Crusher, which also this turn does enable the Twilight Guardian. I'll be... I'll be struggling to see the Twilight Guardian not played this turn, as this is probably one of the last ones you can get it down and get its taunt effect. 
yeah, I, I really like the Guardian coming down here. For, from Dog's perspective, you're hoping that the Doom Guard has to go into this if the, there, there isn't a big buff picked up, but there isn't a big buff picked up. What there is is a Gormok the Impaler, which does much the same job, and this means that Execute is going to remain somewhat stranded in hand for Dog. The Flame Imp, of course, will do three damage to his own face, though, and mean that Draconid comes out as a 9-9 regardless, but the big deal is that Doom Guard gets to remain healthy and stays out of range of that Execute. Yeah, I imagine we're going to see how do you play the Flame Imp into the Grom to the Twilight Guardian, run the Argus to finish off the rest of the Twilight Guardian, therefore leaving the uh, the villager, sorry, not pillager, they kind of ran, um, uh, as a taunt creature there to just block the Grom, so... Uh, this could this is going down to the wire this game and this is how to use uh, life in this match if he needs to win this to carry on and dog needs to win this to close out the series yeah so gormok going to come down here on the twilight guardian how hard you chooses to trade here is very important and he's considered his options significantly this turn but he is going to make the trades in the expected manner and as i said that protects the doom guard from the execute this turn so dog will be looking for uh, some sort of pickup here Alex Stratus' champion is pretty solid. So, yeah. So he can sequence this multiple ways, right? He can actually run the Grom into the uh, Villager, mm -hmm. then sacrifice the Alex Stratus' champion into, say, the Doom Guard to prop the Execute, uh, and still means he can get the Draconic Crusher down as well, because otherwise the, uh, the Grom is going to die to a Doom Guard unless he chooses to trade Grom into the 4-4 and leave the Doom Guard up. So there's multiple choices here. I think running the Grom into the Pillager, uh, the Villager, I'm gonna, that is going to be a mistake I make going forward, clearly. <laughs> uh, I, I put that one in my own mind there. Um, I think that's the best outcome, unless you can spot something else, of course. Well, what I will add to all of these lines that involve spending nine mana on the three cards that we have in our hand means we don't get to armor up which means there is eight damage coming back at you the other way, and you're at nine. That is a scary situation. But the simple fact of the matter is there really isn't anything a great deal better than that. But doing it this way means that he preserves his board and gets to armor up, holds on to the execute. And now two damage is needed with two Ooh. draws. That is two damage. So a little bit of a greedy play there from Dog, choosing to take one less damage off the board to preserve his 10-1 in play. Uh, does get punished, but still... Uh, hard to you know set up a play from there that both represents lethal for you on the following turn and plays around all your opponents out. Uh, Dog was significantly behind in the position that he was, so he went for the greedy play. He chose to live the dream. He'd already seen two abusives being used. He'd seen Gormot being used. He'd seen a Doom Guard, of course, and a Power Overwhelming. So the options were limited, but Dog is going to waste no time here in queuing up his Shaman, and straight away, that's a Lava Burst. And that is a Flame Reef Faceless, so this is going to the face from Dog. Yeah, and how do you there? Obviously, with his Warlock again, he has gone 2-0 with his Warlock so far um, against Dog's lineup. So there is a chance that we can see another Warlock 3-0, uh, at least for the deck alone. So that'll be really interesting to see. As he has, a, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, the Zoo versus the Shaman is as good a matchup as you're really going to get. Uh, so RDU does have his best chance, which is imagine why Dog chose to just, you know, not bother locking in his Shaman uh, beforehand. Pretty pretty good opening for Dog, though, though. He can, uh, he can coin into the Totem Golem if he wants to just get enough power on the board uh, as early as possible. And he has one drops in the form of Lightning Bolt and Rock Bite a weapon to deal with any further minions that come out on RDU's turn. Yeah, he does. And this will immediately put a, a big decision on RDU's side because generally when you see this play come from your opponent, the Coin Totem Golem opening, that means they have a one-mana card in hand. And that one-mana card is quite often Rock Biter or Lightning Bolt. So if he picks up another one-drop here, there we go. Flame Imp is perfect. I'm sure we'll see the Flame Imp Argent Squire come down here, which is less vulnerable to that one-mana removal than just dropping a Dark Peddler would be. Yeah, but you'd lose way too much otherwise. So I do you looking uh, pretty good so far, but Dog still has options. He can now even choose to drop his own Squire if he likes. But it looks like he's going to be the Rock Biter onto the Flame Imp. Remove as much damage as possible off the board, so this will guard their, his Totem Golem as best as possible. 
Yep, and his plays ramp up very, very quickly now. He has back-to-back -back power plays with the Tuscar Totemic and the Flame Wreath Faceless on following turns. So it's going to be up to RDU to firstly flood the board so that the individual powerful minions can't interact too well with what he's doing. And then secondly, find some uh, some powerful buffs from his deck, pick up the Abusive Sergeants and Power Overwhelmings so that he's able to deal with these big threats coming out now. Yeah, and either you drop in the Flame Imp there that you got from the Peddler over the Voidwalker because the Totem Golem will just straight up kill the Voidwalker anyway, the Totem Golem will kill the Flame Imp anyway, and the Voidwalker wouldn't actually protect anything of too much importance on RDU's board regardless. So I kind of like that play, just put as much pressure on as much power as possible. And, uh, you know, Dog, as you said, does have his power plays coming up as he's already sat hovering over the uh, uh, Tuscar Totemic. He is. RDU is just trying to make the decision now as to whether he wants to put damage onto that Totem Golem with either his Divine Shield or his Death Rattle effect. Um, again, generally, if you're playing on Ladder, as soon as you see a, a card that's indicative of an Aggro Shaman, you won't be considering Lightning Storm too much. But firstly, from RDU's perspective, he actually hasn't seen any Aggro Shaman indicative cards yet. He's seen a Totem Golem and a Rock Bio weapon, so he's not entirely sure what list he's playing against. And secondly, the Lightning Storm tech in the aggro list is more popular in tournaments, as we've seen already. So he does have to consider those options. Yeah, the, uh, the Divine Shield does go off the Argent Squire as he chose to trade in there and just set up, you know, at least try and guard the Flame Imp in a roundabout way, as now the, you know, the trade into, as we see, the Peddler there looks more uh, appeasing for Dog as he can play the feral spirit just to guard off the totem golem and you know get, try and get just one more strong trade out of it because that totem golem's done some work this game yeah as yeah it's connected for face it's picked up a value trade already and just purely through the merit of those two flame imps that have been played alongside that totem golem connecting with face once uh RDU's already sat down at 21 so a couple of life taps can already put him into scary doomhammer range if he's not able to pick up a defender of argus at some point in this game yeah, the juggle going to face is not really what he wanted. It means um, he's kind of got to rely on this uh, villager to get the good juggle off oh. as he trades it in. I was just going to say, doesn't that, trade, doesn't that trade with the Flame Imp happen first in every world? The 3-2 into oh, the 2-3? Oh, yeah. Three? Yeah, because you, cause if it goes into the... Uh, hmm. Does it... Oh, yeah, because it gives you the higher odds of killing the Totem Golem, right? So, okay, here's the thing. It depends. So, if you make the trade first, you're increasing the odds of hitting face, which is just outright terrible. But if you're valuing just killing that 3-1 at all costs, then the Flame Imp goes in first. So, I don't think it's actually cut and dry, because hitting any minion there is important. So, the, the line that RDU took was to leave both 2-3s up, and then the knife could have hit either one of the 2-3s as well as the 3-1. Yeah. Then he could have traded the 3-2 into the other remaining 2-3 that didn't get hit. But, from my perspective, you just want to kill that 3-1, right? So, I would have jammed the Flame Imp trade in first and then played the Knife Juggler afterwards. Yeah, but so far now, RDU has cleared most of the board. And it's kind of funny, he got his Doom Guard down and then Dog just responds with his Flame... No mind's bigger, basically, as he just jams that Flame Wreath Faceless onto the board mm -hmm. and has a second one to follow up as well. <sighs> And double power overwhelming is not really the draw he's looking for here. This kind of leaves him in a pretty unfortunate situation either way. I mean, these power overwhelmings probably never get to connect to face if you don't deal them now. But that's not going to win you the game if you just lose the board. Power overwhelming into the 7-7 is a miserable trade and you just concede initiative to your opponent. So what do you do with these power overwhelmings right now? It's really tough, isn't it? Because if you use them to go all in and go face, then, as you said, you know, it's a lot of damage. But then, as Zoo, you know, like, I'd use on the Zoo list, not the Shaman. What are you actually going to draw that's going to actually do the rest of the damage? Doom Guard number two. Yeah, exactly. There's that <laughs> one card. and he, Oh, it looks like he's just going to go phase. I was going to say, either you might favor the one PO onto the 7-7 seven, seven and just say, you know, I hope I can join to, uh, you know, a Forbidden Ritual, right? To just, right. like, refill the board and then go from there. And that's got to be my draw. But he's chose to go phase. Second Flame Wreath comes down. And I don't even know if there's a draw that will help either you at this point. Die Wolf definitely isn't it. That's going to be 15 damage just on board from Dog. We can see there's plenty more where that came from in the hand, and there is almost no way out for either you here. Yeah, and that just that double draw of power overwhelming on that one turn after he'd curved out so well, dumped his hand, got the empty hand Doom Guard. Like you said, Doom Guard immediately contested by the big old 7-7 from Shaman that we all know and love, and 
bricking twice in a row on the double power overwhelming there was just absolutely backbreaking for RDU. And we see the the face shaman from Dog picking up the win, sealing out the series. And you know, we said that is a bad matchup, but as I mentioned, you know, the the data from from Data Reaper shows that it's only ever so slightly unfavored for the aggro shaman, like fifty two percent or something to the zoo. So definitely doesn't seem as bad as most people think it is. The, how it is how it's played out a lot of the time because. Shaman's able to compete on the board early, and if they get a 7-7 down that can't be answered, then that's a huge mess, not to mention if they get two of them down, as we saw at the end of that game. Yeah, going from 0-2 to 2-2 down, you know, RDU was looking pretty good, especially with the slightly favoured matchup in the end, but it wasn't quite enough as Dog did close out that game. So before we get into the next match, we're just going to bring up the groups now and just see how everyone else is getting on so far tonight, as I believe there are some more updated matches, guys. So let's have a look. Naaman picks up another win. So he is locked up at 3-0 at the top of that group now. And the way the other games are, are developing, it's going to be very, very hard for anyone to catch him because there is only one game remaining to be played in that uh, in that group, if I'm looking at it correctly, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, it's going to be very, very difficult for anyone to catch him at 3-0. So he's looking very, very rosy to pick up a spot in the Insomnia True Silver Championship Top 16 uh, but elsewhere, Powder picks up a win over Strife Crow. Boar Control gets himself onto the board with uh, a victory over Ekop. And uh, Hoy, who has been suffering so far, does pick up a much-needed win over AKA Wonder. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we just see the evening progressing now as uh, we're starting to get a, bit, get a bit of an eye as to who's got a really good chance so far. As we can see, just looking at the groups themselves along the top, uh, you mentioned Naaman looking super strong so far. Firebat being 2-0 at this moment in time. Oskaka and Eloise in Group A at 2-0 uh, with ball control 1-1. Ecop looking at 0-3. That's almost a guaranteed out uh, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, all the other groups are looking at like, you know, 1-0, 1-1. So there's still everything to play for. We see the group on the far right, I believe, is the match um, that we've just cast, which will mean RDU and Dog are 1-1 now, right? I think. Uh, no, Dog is 2-0. RDU is 1-1. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it's just uh, yeah. That, that makes that's sense. how Be counting because, works. Because yeah, yeah. That's how uh, that's normally works. I was uh, for some reason looking at a different score line, but never mind. So yeah, we see the evening progressing. We will um, be back after a ten minute break while we sort out the next game for you guys, and we'll keep you uh, updated with the scores as we go. So don't go anywhere, and we'll be back soon. <laughs> 